Good afternoon. Um, before we begin, I always like to get a pulse of the room to see exactly how much knowledge uh, everyone has about binary option fraud. Has everyone here heard of binary option fraud, or some of you guys just hearing it for the first time? Show of hands. First time? Okay. So we're going to take it from the beginning. Um, during this presentation, as I take you inside a multi billion dollar crime ring known as binary options, I'd like to address it from two points of view. One, the first thing everyone should realize this is a retail fraud. The aggregate loss of an average binary option client is $2,000 to a binary option brokerage house. The average client could be handles around $40,000. There are clients which do their losses do total, you know, anywhere up to $10 million. But when we're working in retail fraud, it sometimes is more about the money uh, because $40,000 happens to be a lot of money to some people in this world. Um, and they can't go ahead and hire the best representation. And so when you're working with these individuals, you know, it's more than the money they're looking to recover. Um, the second part of the, the presentation is looking at it from the brokerage's point of view, how we actually set up the structure, um, how this began, uh, how the fraud operates, and where they're moving to next. But uh, like I said, the most important thing is to look, is to look at the victims. Um, talk about three different victims and how they got brought into binary option fraud. The first client that I worked with personally with Wealth Recovery International did was a gentleman named Stephen Cole. Now he has a sick son, uh, he needed to uh, have special high school, he has some behavioral uh, needs as well as some medical needs as well. And his parents, uh, Stephen's parents when he passed away, they left him a trust fund for $1.5 million. He handed over the entire trust over to the binary options company um, and thought that he would get a monthly payout so he can handle his son's uh, education in a special school. Um, you know, thank God that we were able to go ahead to have a full recovery for Stephen. Um, and now his son is actually attending the school, which is, you know, uh, which is always good to hear. Uh, another client we were able to help, uh, Dr. Gary Lerner. Uh, this is a, a pediatric surgeon in Los Angeles, someone who's highly educated. Um, you know, and was able to go ahead and to get uh, conned into this. Another victim, you know, that we're able to help, uh, Marisha Young. Uh, she, you know, is a very devout religious woman. When she heard that she was going to make all sorts of money, she donated most of her furniture, her belongings to the Salvation Army. And what's very unique in Marisha's case is that the, the, the fraudsters, the people running the binary option company, the broker, didn't have the, the chutzpah, so to speak, the nerve to go ahead and actually admit to her that the money was gone. He had his friend go ahead and to relate to her on the telephone that he died of a heart attack, he was resuscitated in an ambulance, and then had a massive coronary and died on the way to a, to a hospital in Paris. So not only did Marisha feel her $400,000 was gone, but also someone who she built a rapport and a relationship with also died as well. Um, you know, the same story goes with Claude, David, Morel. Um, but unfortunately, you know, and the sad truth is, you know, there are people uh, who lose more than money in this type of fraud. Now, this is Fred Turbine. Now, Fred uh, was caught in a binary option scam, uh, 23 traders, um, you know, feeling like ashamed, guilt raided humiliated, not knowing where to turn. He took his own life for less than $400,000. This means there are children without a father and a wife without a husband cause of this type of fraud. So it's more than just the money. Um, and that's, you know, when working in retail fraud, you speak to a lot of different uh, people and their stories, you actually take some of those stories in with you. And I think it's really important uh, for everyone that understands this fraud is to understand who's really victim-based. So what attracts people, you know, so exactly what are binary options? Binary options are instruments of bets on whether the price of any asset will increase or decrease in a certain set of time. Let's just take oil, for example. Let's say, will oil go up or will it go down in the next 15 minutes? Uh, if they, the trader is correct, they would receive, uh, let's say, an average of about an 80% return. And if they were wrong, they would lose 100% of whatever money they placed on that trade. So there's two things that attract people to this. One is that it's extremely simple to understand in concept. And two, to make an 80% return in 15 minutes uh, is extraordinary. Uh, and, and people that have experience in the financial markets would understand that 80% in 15 minutes is, is ludicrous. So how did this start? 
Um, first, uh, about a decade ago is when binary options first came on the scene. Um, fast internet availability, um, a booming online gambling audience, uh, real-time data technology delivery, uh, meaning that we're all accustomed to seeing stock prices and quotes on our cell phones uh, and tablets, uh, zero regulation in a lot of different uh, jurisdictions. Uh, as well, a lot of these companies had to respond because the U.S. outlawed online gambling, and when that market went down, they needed another product to go ahead and to fill the void, and that's where binary options came in. As well, this is a much less complicated product uh, than Forex. Forex, there's a lot of stop loss, take profit, uh, it can get very complicated. With a binary option platform, it's very simple for someone to go ahead and understand, especially with no financial education whatsoever. So, how do they start and get their leads? Now, usually this is done by affiliate marketing. Affiliate marketing is done by clickbait that we see on our cell phones when scrolling through news articles. Um, and maybe it leads you to, to buy a, a Disney World ticket or buy something on Amazon. Now, these affiliate marketers are generating huge amount of uh, huge amount of profits, around four hundred and fifty dollars for every single lead that they are able to go ahead and bring to a binary options brokerage house, um, plus ongoing rev share. Meaning that the more they're able to deposit, the more money these affiliate companies are able to go ahead and to um, to go ahead and make. As well, they have SEO manipulation to ensure prominence of fake and positive content and reviews across Google and social media platforms. Meaning that they will create binaryoptionreview.com and it will look completely like a third party. It would operate almost like a top 10 review uh, or any other review site they were accustomed to seeing. And it would actually go in and say, hey, this binary option company is better than this one. Uh, and it would make it look completely third party. But in reality, it's done by an affiliate who is going ahead and wanting people to join a specific program or a specific binary options company because this is the highest amount of profit the affiliate marketer is going to make off of this. And the affiliate marketing is a huge business in and of itself. So I want to go ahead now, it's very important for me, we're going to go ahead in a second, we're going to actually watch a snippet of actually what do one of these, um, what do some of these marketing videos look like? And this video here is used by um, hundreds of binary option companies. And you know, and to realize this, before you watch it, you may think you need to laugh and think it's extremely comical. But I can assure you that uh, hundreds of thousands of people have been taken you know, by binary option companies and they think this Wall Street Green uh, Billy Bat. Can you go ahead and play the video? Well, congratulations. You just landed on the world's only done for you free money system. That has created 452 new millionaires and 189,671,458 dollars in profit for just the past 90 days. Now, prepare for changes. Big changes. I have over 1.2 billion dollars just sitting in my bank account. Now, I never thought this would happen to me. And but, all right, so as, as we can see that we're probably watching this and we can see these actors are someone they found on Fiverr. Um, you know, but I'm telling you, this is what gets people roped into this. So it's, sometimes it's very difficult for people, you know, when going ahead and fighting this type of fraud, they don't understand how they were taken in and how they lost, uh, you know, over upwards of $100,000 to a video like that. Um, and this is where, um, we are going to go ahead and explain exactly how uh, the house always wins. Much like the gambling, binary options trading is a betting culture. You know, if your prediction is wrong, you lose all the money you invested. Prediction is right, you receive your money back, plus return, which is usually like an 80%. So you would think. Now, just to give you an example, let's just say that you know someone walked into a casino and they walked over to a roulette team. They took a hundred dollars out, and they said they put the hundred dollars on the black. Uh, they spin the wheel. Uh, sure enough, it ends up on black. Okay. Now the, the gambler has two hundred dollars in chips in front of him. Has the casino at this point made money, or have they lost money? Made money. Made yes. money. The casino has made money. Or they lost money. Lost. The casino has lost. The casino has lost money. Correct. Not yet. The gambler has won, the casino has lost? Not yeah. yet. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So this is where we want to get to. So what ends up happening, no, the casino has still made money at this point because the, the gambler has not taken the chips and went to the cage to exchange them for cash. 
So as long as the, the, the gambler is looking around with chips in their hand and not walking around with cash, the casino is going to win and the house always wins. And this is how binary option fraud, how it boils down, is by not giving those chips or not giving the, the what's on their platform, exchanging that back into cash. Now, how a binary option sale works and how they go ahead and lure people um, is during a five-step sale. All right, so the first thing that they will do is to create an introduction with somebody. Um, at that point, with that introduction, it's usually creating a fake name, um, you know, giving them, you know, this is the binary option company, and starting to go ahead and to do a KYC on the phone, meaning know your client. At this point, what a binary option broker house is looking to do is to get, you know, every single piece of information from one from a potential victim. Where do they work? Political affiliation, how many children they have, are they married, are they divorced, what's their favorite sports team, you name it, it's to go ahead and to know everything there is to do about that particular client. Because the next the next stage is once you have collected all of the information on a potential victim, it moves on to the third stage, which is mirroring or exploiting the client. Now I don't know if psychologically if anyone has ever noticed that maybe we're walking and we see someone drop something on the floor. Uh, they, they bend down to pick it up, and sure enough, they come and they hit their head on the table. We've all seen this. And the normal reaction for most people when you see someone hit their head is to grab their own heads and say, ow. <laughs> right? This is mirroring. This is something primal that's in each and every one of us that goes to connect, to show empathy, and to connect. Mm -hmm. Now, what they do, binary option companies, they take advantage of this in a sales tactic. So during that bits and pieces of information they have collected, they're able to go ahead and use it against you. Meaning, ah, you have two children, I have two children. You're divorced, I'm divorced. Um, you know, your parent just died, my parent just died. You're a Yankee fan, I hate the Red Sox. Whatever it could be, that's potentially what they will do on the phone, is to go ahead and show as much commonality to build trust and rapport with them. At this point, the fourth stage is creating a sense of urgency, um, and they will begin to go ahead and do a little bit um, of this on the first call. It's saying they will take some type of market event, uh, take an example, anything that you would find in the news, and say, hey, listen, I, you know, in the next 45 minutes, Donald Trump is gonna get on TV, and he's gonna say he's going to drop a rocket in North Korea. Now, if this is gonna happen, and the, the, the US dollar is gonna go haywire. Right now, what we want to do is we want to put in $10,000, and I will give you a $10,000 bonus into your own trading account. Now you have $20,000. This is how confident we are with this event. Uh, they'll create this urgency and begin to go for the close. This is how a binary option scam is, how the sales call is actually made, and how the victim gets caught up into this. Having felt that report, and then having that sense of urgency placed upon them. Now, company ethics and how they're going ahead and recruiting salespeople, there's three distinct ways in how they actually go ahead and recruit, which is one, desensitize people to the crime, dehumanize the victims, um, and provide a sense of belonging, especially to uh, new immigrants or new people that are outcasts in society or may have not had a role, especially in this role. So when we, we're talking desensitizing them to the crime, um, before anyone gets onto the phone, before they commit this fraud, they're hearing this fraud over and over again, hundreds of times. And by that point, it becomes that second nature, that any type of morality that someone may have had is completely gone. The second thing is dehumanizing the victims and saying it's just another voice on the other end of the telephone. It's not actually a human being there. This is just a game and you have to challenge them. If they're telling you that they have cancer, or if they are sick, whatever reason they possibly would have, it doesn't matter. This is just a voice. It's not a real person. To disconnect the human being and disconnect their humanity from that human being. And the third, especially in Israel, um, where they go ahead, a lot of this recruitment is done, and about 50% of the employees in binary options um, you know, are uh, immigrants to Israel, and that's where most of the thought does take place, um, is that people are new immigrants. They come from all over the world and they don't know anybody, they don't speak Hebrew. And one of the things they will say is they'll say, the people will say, achi, achi, anachno mishpacha. Now Moshe, what does that mean? <laughs> exactly. So uh, it means we're family. So usually they'll put their hand around their shoulder and they'll make them feel like they're part of, they're part of a big family. 
And when they start to say, listen, I don't want to be this way, I don't want to work in binary options, this hand around their shoulder moves very quickly to around their neck uh, and to make sure that they're unable to go ahead and to leave. Uh, and this happens to many different people that I've spoken with personally who feel that they were exploited and they can't get out from working from these types of companies, very similar to uh, organized crime or some type of street gang. Um, the scam and how it works. Once a buy and once a trader has invested the money into binary options, the broker makes it almost impossible for them to withdraw their funds. Um, to coerce the trader into investing more money, the broker will allow for them a very small amount of money. This is a popular manipulation tactic. So there's three ways in which people are able to get their money back out of a binary options company. The first is gonna be completing a chargeback contact in their credit card processor um, in the first 120 days. It's a straightforward procedure. Uh, I think in the UK there's a rule 75 or some type of bank fraud. Um, the second way to go ahead and to do this is they will actually release the broker houses, will release a small amount of money in the beginning as a test of draw. Once you're able to see the money coming back to you, you're able to feel a little bit more confident and you're able to maybe convince your wife that you should put more money in or you'll feel that you should move your 401k or your pension uh, to the binary option company. But once you see money coming back in your direction, um, you feel okay. The third way in which I've seen people get money out of these types of companies is actually to stay on the scam, so to speak. Let's say that you put $10,000 in, they say, listen, if I get this 10 grand back, I'll invest uh, $200,000. At that point, they would feel like, hey, it's worth a chance. And this is sometimes we'll you know, speak to clients to walk them through this, of how to, to scam the scam, so to speak, so they can become whole again. Um, you know, right now, we wanna go ahead and how the commission structure works, um, how the scam actually works. Now, what we're looking at here is an actual indictment from the FBI um, obviously, in UK has got some really strict uh, slander laws, or what I've been warned from my attorney. So, I'll have to bear with me, and um, you know, like a couple of things out here. Now, binary option employees receive about five to eight commission, com eight percent commission on deposits, um, you know, minus their withdrawals, uh, providing further incentive not to allow clients to withdraw. So, let's read through this um, section 28 on the FBI indictment. It says the salespeople and managers receive commissions based on the amount of deposits obtained. According to witness one and two, customer withdrawals were deducted from deposits when calculating commissions. This incentivized sales staff and managers to do everything possible to prevent withdrawals. Defrauding the client. Now, how does, how does the actual fraud take place and what are they actually doing here in order to make sure the client is never gonna see this money again? They, how do you make sure that you don't want, from their point of view, for the client to think that their money was stolen? Um, if the binary option company does everything correct, it makes it, it should look like they've done nothing at all. Um, so the first thing they'll do is downplay the, the risks of binary option trading. Um, they want to talk how, you know, how this will actually work. Um, two, they'll use hidden and unclear terms and conditions. Um, three, managed accounts. So what a lot of the time which will happen is, as we watched that video before, um, what they'll do is after someone has placed money into that kind of free money system, um, they will then get, a broker will get on the phone with someone and say, listen, you're obviously not making so much money with this crazy Walter Green cash money system. You need to be trading with a broker like anyone else in the financial markets. I have a ton of experience and this is where this pivot will come in. They will do this modified via COPA and say, you're right. This software, this original way you were trading or why, how you came to me, is definitely not going to work, and it's a little bit deceptive. I will admit to you this, so I can really, and so that now you should trust me. I'm, I'm going ahead and exposing part of the fraud, and this is why they should trust the broker to go ahead and handle their assets and trade for them. And this is a very common, uh, this is a very common technique um, to go ahead and getting someone to build up trust with the broker. Um, really talking about bonuses here, and this is something that will come across with every binary option victim. A bonus is you know, money that they're adding into the trader's account, and this, and this trade has terms and conditions to it. Now, every dollar that's placed into, as a, into the trader's account as a bonus has a 30 to 60% turnover. So imagine somebody deposits $10,000 $10, into a binary options company, and they are matched with a $10,000 bonus. 
they would have to complete three hundred to six hundred thousand dollars in trading turnover before they are able to withdraw one cent of their own money. Pretty much, this was never going to happen. And once the client accepts a bonus into their trading account, their money is gone. Okay. Two, you know, in the sense of part of this one thing, when all of their processes fail in order to burn a client, they will just refuse to let the money go. Uh, I've actually seen internal emails uh, with somebody asking for a forty thousand dollar withdrawal, and it was signaled to one of the brokers to go into the account um, to burn the client. They opened up twenty trades, lost all the trades. And then he put a South Park meme and it's gone at the bottom of his email and they were laughing how they're frauding someone for $40,000. Um, so this really goes into states here on the affidavit again. Uh, this is the criminal indictment from the FBI. It says, according to witnesses one and two, salespeople were instructed to address client withdrawal requests at the start of each shift. The sales staff was instructed by management to take steps to delay or prevent withdrawals. Sales staff sought to convince clients to keep their money on deposit by promising future results or offering special investment packages that did not actually exist. According to witness number one and number two, customers who deposited funds by wire had very little chance of executing a successful withdrawal request as there was no threat of a chargeback, as there would be with credit card, just with credit card deposits. So I really want to go ahead and look at the victim's journey. Um, exactly how they would go ahead and do this here from start to finish. Okay, so as we see, the client will walk into the signals in the software that was that video which we saw from the beginning. And at that point, two things will happen with the client: either they will right away go ahead and make a deposit of two hundred to fifty dollars to five hundred dollars, or they will just sign up on the form. Um, if he just signs up without speaking, without going ahead and making that initial deposit. He will be brought to a conversion department and speak with a conversion agent. This job here is for the conversion agents to get the, the, the trader to just deposit the first $250. Now, he will say, hey, the software is great, just $250, let's give it a shot, no problem. Once that money is in, they'll go through the compliance department, getting all their documents, driver's license, copies of credit cards, utility bills, you name it. They're saying this is for the client's uh, protection. Really what this is, and to fight against AML um, or regulations, really what this is is to prevent credit card chargebacks um, for clients. Once, this, once they're through the compliance department, they are going to be moved over to the retention department. And the retention department are huge call centers, which really go ahead and print the cash. At this point here, they'll speak with someone who presents fake credentials, may present themselves in a PhD, giving them a fake name, uh, maybe sitting in Israel, or the Philippines, or what have you, but they'll say he's sitting in the UK, uh, and he's got uh, you know 10 years of experience, and he's, a, uh, he's got a 90% success rate trade. Um, what the retention agent will do is build that rapport with the, with the victim, and offer them a couple of different incentives in order for them to take the money. Either in short trades, manage account, bonuses, guaranteed profits, you name it, I've seen you know, you name it, they will go ahead and throw it uh, to the client in order to get as much money as possible. In the beginning, the client will go ahead to make a little bit of money to boost their confidence. Um, and sometimes that's even manipulated, which we'll go into in a little bit. Um, and as that client goes ahead and makes their money, they will go ahead and continue to ask for deposits into the brokerage firm. Till they feel the binary option brokerage firm, feels they have built the client for everything that they have, um, that's when they're going to go ahead and make the switch. The client will then ask for a withdrawal and say, hey, listen, I'd like to see some of my profits. They will burn the account and then the client will end up being scammed. Now, unfortunately, I've spoken with clients and after this has happened to them and they're hundreds of thousands of dollars in with multiple binary option companies. As I've just presented something which seems extremely you know, easy to understand the fraud and to see how straightforward this is, they are in disbelief and shock. Um, when dealing with a lot of the victims of this type of retail fraud, they can't go ahead and, and accept it to internalize this. Um, and there's this like cognitive dissonance that takes place inside them. Um, and this has really been some of the experience in which we've seen. Um, and any, any which way you slice it, this is where the victim is and this is how the scam has been run. Now, how do, now I want to switch kind of gears a little bit and to be looking at how we go ahead and set up a binary option brokerage and we're looking at it from the other side.
All right. So the first thing they will need to do is choose a uh, platform, which is a technological provider, which is going to actually do the real-time data. Um, incorporate an offshore company at this point. Build a website. Now go ahead and get a legal opinion from a lawyer for the banking and the payment processors. Getting the legal opinion is extremely important. Now there have been only a, this is an actual legal opinion that we've taken. Um, we've got you know, someone submitted to us. Um, this right here, uh, some of the lawyers, they are operating for many of the same binary option companies. So some of the lawyers are handling 20, 25 binary option brokerages and just setting them up all day. Uh, creating a bank account, getting a payment processor, hiring sales reps, and start marketing. All right, so let's just look at some of the platform providers. Now the technology platforms charge setup fees to the brokers and an ongoing rep share, which in some cases can reach as high as 15%, 50%, but sometimes, most of the time, it's around 15%. Um, Spot Option, Panda, uh, Aerosoft, Hello Markets, uh, Tech Financials. Tech Financials is actually traded on the footy here in the UK. Uh, Spot Option probably handles about 50% of the binary option industry. Um, and, you know, and so as we go ahead and explore a little bit more, these companies here are really intertwined with the brokerages. It's not that they're just going ahead and providing the technology, even though that some of this technology is used for regulated entities. Um, there happens to be you know, a lot of crossover with the, the brokerages, which are currently brought, um, and the platform providers. Um, in this part of the, uh, the, in the criminal indictment here, the platform providers are so involved in the operation that they manipulate the platform dashboards to ensure high-risk clients lose. And this is again from the FBI indictment. Um, so witnesses number one and number two advise that the brokerage and the technology platform work together um, as needed to increase the likelihood that particular customers would lose money on trades. Other former industry insiders have also informed the FBI that the technology provider and binary option brands work together to ensure that clients who were having a high success rate of winning trades would lose future trades. Now it also would work obviously in the beginning, they would lower the risk levels so that someone would begin winning trades. And after those risks of the, after they got them more confidence, they're winning a couple of trades, this is when they would put the high risk in and the client's account would start to go ahead to, you know, to be burned. Now to show you here what some of the uh, to show you exactly what uh, what a platform will go ahead and look like here, these are the same technology platforms, uh, very similar. The only thing different is the colors, pretty much, but it's the same exact platform as you guys can see. Uh, but they just go ahead and it's all white, you know, whatever the case may be. It's just, it's just different colors. Uh, they're able to go ahead and to just sell it, and the same technology behind each and every one of them. Now, some of the offshore jurisdictions of choice for binary brokers, uh, the Marshall Islands. Panama, Dominica, and Rilo, which has kind of cleaned up exactly in the last couple of years. Uh, St. Vincent and the Grenadines is definitely a favorite. Samoa, uh, or anywhere that doesn't require a financial license, or even better, a place that requires a financial license, but just to kind of pay for a bond and there's no real enforcement of anything. So you're able to say, hey, I got a financial license. Who's, who's enforcing this license? Nobody's too sure. Um, so let's go ahead and look at an offshore setup map. And this is really where it becomes very difficult, especially for someone who, for retail fraud, we're talking aggregate loss, forty thousand dollars. You're dealing with a registered, you know, one offshore country jurisdiction. Let's say in this case, St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Um, they're holding their funds in a, in a check bank. Um, they're running the sales, conversion, retention um, from Tel Aviv, and they're telling you that, hey, I'm sitting, I'm sitting in London. All right. So where do they hire an attorney? Where, where are they supposed to look? You know, what does the client know? They, you know, they think, they've been told they're in the UK, they do some digging and they see, oh, St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Maybe they see a bank wire form that says Czech Republic, or an average retail, you know, for a retail fraud victim. You know, it doesn't, there's not so many choices for them to go ahead and to start getting relief from their assets. So where does the money go? Uh, the client money deposits, and we're looking to a payment service provider. Um, now 15%, 10 to 15% of that is held in a rolling reserve for chargebacks in case a client does go ahead and force the refund through their bank. Um, then we'll move to an acquiring bank in Eastern Europe, okay? Um, where obviously the payment service providers and the acquiring bank will go ahead and earn, um, you know, maybe a couple of basis points off this, which will then end up into the merchant's bank of a binary option company. 
Now that bank is going to be registered to an offshore entity, um, and so it looks like they are keeping their money in Europe, but when they register this money to an offshore entity, uh, they're not so much doing this for, for tax fraud. Um, they are mostly looking this uh, to that no one can find the money. And this is the most, this is the biggest piece of the puzzle um, of where they're keeping their money. The money usually stays somewhere in Eastern Europe, but is registered to a foreign entity which has nothing to do with binary options whatsoever. The payment service providers, um, you know, binary option companies are viewed as extremely high risk merchants. PSPs, a payment service provider, can therefore charge anywhere from 6 to 15% of all transactions and an additional rolling reserve of 10% is kept for chargebacks and only released after 180 days. Um, these are some of the companies which go ahead and handle binary option companies, Fibonetics, Carpay 21, Dotapay. Um, and I want to spend some time onto this slide here. This is a, a company here that we went ahead and we mapped out here to actually see how this process works. Um, as we take a look at this here, this gives you a whole system. Um, we got a company here, Grey Mountain Management. We want to look at the structure of how this company was set up. Um, obviously, here we have the we have the three UBOs, the ultimate beneficiary owners. Um, you know, David, Josh, Jonathan, um, and they own a, You know, they are just uh, really in charge of this. In this Grey Mountain Management, they're able to go and have the technology platform, which you spoke about earlier. They pay a processor. They actually have an aggregator account, which are able to process binary. They're able to process credit card transactions. Okay, um, so when they have this company set up, they have their own binary option brands, like Rich Capital, Romelia Capital, B Options, and the service entity, which is going ahead and handling this, a company Tracy PII that was sitting in Tel Aviv. Now, because this was a one-stop shop, where most of when you set up that binary option company, they went to. One company for affiliate marketing, another one had the brokerage house, the other one was doing the payment processing, the other one was doing the, tech, the, the technical aspect of this. They brought everything under one roof. So, what they were able to do was then to sell different parts of their system to competitive brands in order to corner a lot of the market uh, with their you know, CRM. And so, they were providing payment servicing providers um, to numerous binary option brands. Uh, this company was handling at least to my knowledge right now, from 27 to 35 binary option brands. Now, they were also going into having an offshore mutual company um, with strong end directors. One of the other things you were able to do in contacting this company or you know, doing business with them, not only if you wanted to get into the binary option business, they'll get you a uh, platform, they'll get you marketing, they'll get you uh, technology, they'll get you payment processing, they'll also go ahead and get you some strong end directors. Who will go ahead and be on the, you know, to go ahead and to protect um, the ultimate beneficiary owners from any type of prying eyes, um, as well as they have been appointed directors um, for dozens of binary brands, um, uh, all located at the Ulysses House in Dublin. So, you know, and to, to really go and show you the average binary option brand, as we're talking here, is doing a roughly volume uh, about six to eight million dollars a month. Um, and they're probably the profit on this with the minus of withdrawals, 90%. So let's just say at their heyday, Great Mountain was handling 30 binary option firms and doing six to eight million a month. You can talk about the amount of money. So even we're talking on a matter of retail fraud, when the average binary option client to them is worth $2,000, average client losses is $40,000, these guys are making tens of millions, so at least hundreds of millions of dollars from just going ahead and scamming ordinary individuals. Okay, and that's really the binary profit model, which is binary money deposited minus trading withdrawals equals profit for binary option companies. So, obviously here, I don't know if you've heard that, uh, you know, where most are, I would say 85 to 90% of the binary option companies are located inside of Israel. For sure, 95% of them are run by Israelis. Um, now, why is this? Um, one, cutting edge is really technology outside of Silicon Valley, the amount of high tech that happens in Tel Aviv is everything from Waze, every company's got an R&D facility inside of Tel Aviv. Technology, just like a knife or, you know, uh, nuclear energy can be used for good, can be used for bad. Um, this is definitely something that's used for the negative side, but the technology is definitely there. Gaming became unregulated, like I said, uh, gaming became regulated. And because it's regulation in the gaming market, it was the same individuals, and they were looking for this type of market of where to put, uh, what kind of product they're able to sell 
um, to the list of leads in which they already have. Uh, intercontinental multilingual available workforce. Um, a lot of the times um, that you have a lot of people immigrating uh, to Israel, especially from Europe, and they speak the language, uh, so to speak. Um, you know, one of the biggest victims, uh, victim countries uh, for binary options is in France. There's a lot of French people who moved to Israel. And one of the like, disturbing parts of how they've been recruiting uh, the French workforce uh, has been saying, listen, why did you guys move to Israel? They didn't move to Israel for some religious reason or some Zionist fervor. They moved there because some anti-Semitism that happened in Paris or happened in France. And they use this and say, listen, you left France because of anti-Semitism, it's okay to defraud people in France. This is the sick twist of logic that people have used in order to recruit this. Um, so, I mean, just to show you how disturbing and how disgusting that thought is, I don't like painting Israel this way, but I, I tell you the truth. I mean, you know, not uh, you know, not all Israelis are committing fraud, but a lot of people committing fraud happen to be Israelis. Um, <laughs> okay, and two, and four, this limited government resources. I'm sure everyone can understand. There's a lot of geopolitical situations. It's a small country. There's a lot of different threats that go on, and the government can only do so much. You know, what I'm planning to say. Um, is that uh, as of uh, six weeks ago, the binary option companies have been, there's been some slight regulation which have taken place as well. Um, other things that have happened now, uh, think, I think hopefully I'll take a little bit of credit, but I'm saying that from our success, there have been some fraudulent recovery companies, almost like a Nigerian print scam attached to this, saying, hey, listen, we found your money, it's somewhere. Just pay the taxes to that money, but we're going to send it right over to you. Um, and so it really goes ahead and they're contacting the victims um, and just doing the scam 2.0. This is really muddy the waters, and so the victims really believe they're hopeless, so they won't go ahead and hire a, you know, an attorney or go ahead and get help. Once they've been scammed, they're trying to get the money back one time. Um, legal jurisdictions. Um, several countries have banned binary option trading within the country and have taken uh, measures to ban advertising from external countries. USA, Canada, Australia, Belgium, France, um, and Israel. This is the, obviously, you know, USA and Canada, for sure not. Um, Australia, Belgium, you know, now these countries, you can read about this. The Israel one is very unique, and I want to get into this for a little bit. Um, it's, they passed this bill, and so all this group law. It was really a big political talking point because it's an extremely watered down version. The law gives all binary option firms 30 months to cease operations giving them times to move to abroad to you know, areas with no regulation, such as Romania, Ukraine, or move to, uh, so, you know, to Cyprus, which is the European Union, and they're able to do business in Europe under CISA. Uh, now, obviously, when this takes in place, when they just ban binary options, um, and not ban banning CFDs or unregulated Forex or cryptocurrency frauds, we're gonna see what we saw from people moving from the gaming to the binary options, to binary options moving to cryptocurrency diamonds and CFDs, which are contract for differences. This is the same people, same business model, different product, but now they have the list of names, the people they know that they can go after on the phone. Again, uh, binary options is a saturated model. Companies have closed down, but platforms can easily modify to demonstrate the advantages of other future trades. Cryptocurrencies, diamonds, CFDs, and forex. Now, I want to cover you know a little bit about the cryptocurrency because this is something which is going to explode uh, in the next six months, and it hasn't already started doing so. There's three distinct cryptocurrency frauds that are being run today. The first one is a very simple; it's just like the binary option, but instead you're telling them to buy Bitcoin, then taking the Bitcoin to deposit to the binary options trading platform. Therefore, they can't charge back; they can't withdraw; their money's gone into. The second one is doing an ICO, initial coin offering, uh, which falls into this little you know, thing here. They'll call you up and say, hey, listen, we got this new, uh, the next Bitcoin. Now it's only at $5, but you should go ahead and it's going to be worth $30 soon. Go ahead and give me your money. Um, and you have the third one, which is the Bitcoin bank scam, which is really taking the most amount of, is taking the line share of the, the cryptocurrency funds. It works something like this. Uh, you contact somebody and you say, hey, listen, we are a crypto bank, we will go ahead and give you a 30% bonus um, that you're able to go ahead and have that 30% bonus right away. As long as you agree to keep your money tied in the bank for six months to nine months, almost like a CD, all right? So what is very scary about this cryptocurrency fraud is that bonus is actually real. That's the only thing real in this fraud. 
So right away through their wallets of that, uh, you know, where they're keeping their Bitcoin, 30% of that bonus they receive is actually made into Bitcoin. They're able to get it, they're able to go ahead and buy stuff and to see that's real Bitcoin. Now, they're gonna get really confident and feel, hey, listen, the bank is probably real, the bonus is real, and this is going up and up and up. Every single day I get calls to my office and they're saying, hey, listen, I just got recruited to go work in a Bitcoin fraud. Uh, we probably have three people lined up when I get back Wednesday and Thursday to speak with about working or they got of course to work in this type of fraud already. Now, one of the things that we have tried to do in order to go and help the, you know, with recover on this aspect, since we are talking retail fraud, um, you know, they can't go ahead and hire an attorney, some of those 40 grand, you can't hire someone who's charging 500 euros an hour, it just doesn't make sense. Um, one, one of the things we like to do is to go ahead and collect many different clients who may have been defrauded by the same binary option company, and then go ahead and put 100 clients against the same company and give them a full rate of attorney. Once we went ahead and mapped everything out and were able to do all the grunt work, and now we just need someone to do the heavy lifting. Also, we like to get everything digitalized, and so we're able to do all the POP work and get, a, uh, get everything into our CRM. So this means that we're able to keep this electronically. Obviously, I know uh, that uh, you know the, the hands of justice will never move as the hands of the same speed as the hands of crime. But we can try to catch up a little bit. I gotta tell you, I'm 33 years old, but every time I walk into an attorney's office, I feel like I walked into like the 90s. There's paper everywhere, you know, it just seems like, uh, you know, it seems like everyone's kind of stuck in the 20th century. We try to move everything to the 21st century and get everything digitally done so we can move a little bit quicker um, and, and be able to, uh, you know, to be able to catch up for this type of fraud. Um, you know, the recovery model which we do work with is we like to go ahead and to speak with individuals who have worked in this type of fraud. Um, now that they're moving or they get a con, they, they, get, uh, they start feeling some remorse, they'll come in and speak to us. We'll go ahead and uh, get their uh, pay stuff from working at the actual place in, in Tel Aviv where they were selling the binary options. They'll come in and sign an affidavit for us, which will go ahead and give us the owner's names, their locations, how the farm is working, um, gathering intelligence and mapping the culprits, uncovering the really UBOs and decision makers. At this point, hopefully, we're able to then go ahead and present all the information to these culprits, to the binary option workers' houses, say, hey, listen, this is the evidence in which we have for the client. Either A, you can return the client's money right now, or we can move this start to the legal proceedings. Um, you know, and hopefully they're able, most of the time, um, most of the time they'll just return the client's money because you know, it's not worth it for them. They've done so much work to go ahead and to hide themselves. <laughs> Um, and to layer themselves so deeply that once you're willing to go ahead and uncover all this information, it's, it's not worth the 30 grand it is to them to have to restructure again and again and again. So that's the way we like to do it when the when the client, when we do have a client's loss that was you know, $10 million, this obviously needs to go to litigation. You're not gonna write a letter and get $10 million you know, from a binary option company. Um, you know, that's really going to go into how we go ahead and fight this uh, what I'd like to do now is open the floor to questions you guys have, and I really you know, appreciate everybody coming. It seems like a uh, pretty large crowd. I really thank you for, uh, for coming here. Thank you. So, where do you pursue legal action? Sure. Uh, good question. So, multiple jurisdiction. What we will try to do is to always get U.S. jurisdiction at all possible. We scare them because the U.S. has taken some criminal action, and so this is kind of the hot flavor of the week. So either it's going ahead, they traded in U.S. dollars, I mean, uh, as well, and we'll hire some people, and should, I work a lot with, so we try to hire Arthur Vandesan here to do a lot of the U.S. Treasury work, and to get something that's really good with that, I mean, so, she go ahead and you know, definitely speak with him and other types of issues, but uh, that's what we'll always try to get to a U.S. jurisdiction. If can't, we'll sue them in Israel, um, or in whatever jurisdiction their money might be. So we always try to do the U.S. because does it, in Israel there's a 2.5 percent filing fee, and the petitions are a nightmare, and it's got everything's got to be translated to Hebrew. If we can do everything into the U.S., um, that would be great. Uh, but to anyone who does business in Israel or knows the court system in Israel, it's like a it's a real nightmare. It seems that you have sound empirical data that Israel is the originator of this, originator and the main propeller of this fraud, binary options fraud. And it seems uh, that the technology platform is a key component of implementing that fraud. 
So have you thought of a disruption strategy for the technology platform? Or is this the provider you're looking at? You know, one, we're looking to get the money back is for the client, for retail fund. Now, let's just look at a company that's spot, spot option. They are worth $5 billion. I, the clients or myself do not have the time or like resources to go ahead and tackle such a big thing. I mean, that's just the, the truth. And so, um, we definitely are starting to look at it, and that's definitely a legal strategy to have. But we're always looking to go ahead and to do two things, to get us money back to the client as quickly as possible, and also to get them a, a, some peace of mind. Um, you know, when they, because when we deal with retail club, sometimes we'll speak to a client who lost 10 grand, and he's like, I want these guys, I want them to deal with pain, because I love pain. And so, and it's like, hey, this, you know, let's just say that someone sent them $10,000 and they were whole, that wouldn't give the guy the relief in which he's looking for. He's like, I want to know the person who took, you know, who took my money over the phone, who lied to me, who is this guy? So we are looking at that angle, but a lot of the times there's a lot of emotion that's based into a lot of the victims on the streets of Um So, but it's definitely an angle we're all looking at, and when you know it becomes harder to, to get money from the broker terms, we definitely are going to have to start pursuing um, some of the technology providers, and hopefully at that point we have you know built a little bit of a reputation, and we have a little bit more um, resources to muster to go ahead and to tackle such a thing. Any successful prosecutions? Uh, did it, did it, um, end it? Any successful prosecution in the case of the violations? Um, well, as of right now, they're on a criminal side. Um, there was a binary option CEO who was arrested on the 14th of September at JFK Airport um, for defrauding the U.S. victims, and that was the the, the pretty much the, the crack in the iron. Um, when it comes to civil, when it comes to civil litigation. Um, most of this stuff settles before it actually will go um, to litigation. They don't want to go and have, uh, especially with me. I know of a couple of cases um, that have lost actually binary options. And there's four, in Israel, there's four different cases, if I'm not mistaken, of binary option fraud, which was kicked out of Israeli courts. Um, and this is because the attorneys, the people handling the type of fraud, weren't really versed into it and they did not have structure the petition. Comparing it not legally to gambling, um, and that's really a lot of different things. It's been a quite of a challenge, and I think that when I'm speaking with attorneys, a lot of the time, um, and I know there's a lot of attorneys here, but sometimes attorneys can be like really arrogant. Sometimes and it's very difficult uh, to get a lot of the information. You know, saying, "Hey, this is what's going on," and how do we communicate the same information to an attorney and to a victim at the same time? Um, and once you know, we're able to speak with attorneys and they're able to understand this type of fraud because when I show them that video, they're like, their minds are like, how does somebody fall for that? They don't get it. Um, and that's the hardest part of going ahead and communicating and for them to understand what the fraud took place. And that's where we're always looking to build a network of attorneys and people that we have like dedicated partners that we're able to move with like at a moment's notice and they understand how the fraud works, you know, what the client's needs are, um, being able to work within our parameters and the client's parameters and being able to go after them, you know, right away. Um, and that's really what we're looking for to build a network of attorneys. Uh, and we're, we just put together a really, really nice CRM, uh, which would be able to hold a lot of data and to go back and forth with us uh, and to move this thing on really, really quickly. Um, and I, this is something I'm really excited about. You know, it's starting to work. Yeah. Yeah, you mentioned that um, one of the reasons that the Binary options uh, hunters collect due diligence is to try and build a rapport with the victim. Mm -hmm. But you also said that uh, having this due diligence prevents credit card chargebacks. Mm -hmm. How does it prevent chargebacks? Sure. Um, so, when doing a credit card chargeback, usually the victim has one opportunity in order to file the chargebacks. There's many different credit card codes um, in which the client can go and have. Most of the time, the client or the victim will say, hey, this is a fraudulent transaction. Um, and they won't go ahead because of a lot of shame and humiliation. They will say, hey, listen, I was defrauded. I didn't do this transaction. It wasn't me. I didn't get involved with this. They will then have, hey, listen, here are the terms and conditions he signed. Here's his driver's license. Here's the credit card trend. Here's the copy of his credit card, which he sent over to us. This is meaning the client doesn't want to pay. He lost the money fair and square. Um, how we fought the chargebacks and had some success is by saying the product not delivered as advertised. This will give us a little bit more time. We've gotten some chargeback for clients 
I think going up to maybe certain banks have 460 days after the transaction, but many times without the legal letter of opinion or someone who's experienced in fighting with the, the bank, it's going to be extremely, extremely difficult uh, for them. And so if a client, they have one opportunity. It's not like, hey, it was fraud. They say no. Then you go back and say, ah, oh, it was, you know, no, I meant to say it wasn't as I got the, the goods or service for to advertise. The bank won't want to hear you again. And they know that. Uh, and two, they go ahead and even threaten the, the before the chargeback is issued, they will go ahead and threaten the, uh, you know, the victim witness and say, you can't charge back, I have your ID, I have all this stuff, um, you know, if you try to charge back, you're going to lose, you know, uh, and then so they prevent them from even trying. Any other questions? Yeah? So, which one fraud? <clears throat> yeah. What is the future? This, the future with Bitcoin, that's, this pretty much is going to be the future. So uh, I'm not an expert in Bitcoin, I'm more of an expert in Bitcoin fraud, but as far as I know, the algorithm is going to end down to 2019, 2020. Um, but the way this is going to work is because they already have the list of people that have deposited into binary options fraud, they're just going to re-email blast the same individuals again. And I really believe that the fraud is going to be the Bitcoin bank scam. The ICO scam is definitely the, the hottest one right now, but longevity-wise, it's definitely going to be, hey, you keep your regular money in the bank, keep your Bitcoin in the Bitcoin bank. We're going to give you 30%, like a CD, not going to be 1%, and it won't get it after the, the time expires up. You'll get it now. Uh, and the reason I'm able to tell you this with pretty much certainty is the amount of response that you'll get. Um, we have, um, you know, a, a pretty decent advertising campaign that goes ahead and targets, you know, pretty much social media in Tel Aviv um, of people that we used to work in buying our option fraud and we incentivize them to come forward. Um, in the last six weeks or so, since the binary option regulation has taken hold in Israel, the phones have been ringing nonstop and saying, hey, listen, I was recruited to work in this type of binary, uh, this type of cryptocurrency fraud. And as well, clients as well calling or potential clients saying, hey, listen, I was taken in this type of crypto fraud as well. Um, this is being targeted very heavily right now in the French markets uh, as well because we're getting a lot of French calls, um, you know, into our office. Yeah. Uh, are you cooperating with uh, state authorities to the police? I mean, since now you are observing that the, uh, actually it is a crime, the fraud, I mean, with, with Bitcoin too. And you see that this bubble will blow. So, uh, <coughs> police uh, institutions will need to react. I mean, do they cooperate now with you, or I mean, do they ask your advice, or how? What do you advise to do? I mean, because it's uh, now it's the moment uh, which you need to prepare. Uh, police authorities will be able to catch uh, to catch them on hand in this. Uh, in this step, and they will try to resign clients to the next level. Sure. Um, when it comes to law enforcement, I have been in touch with a couple of law enforcement agencies in the United States and in Israel. Um, you know, tax authorities, things like this. Um, usually, what ends up happening is that uh, you know, most of the time, I'm looking for relief for the big, for the clients in which we have, and this is really where of uh, you know. I don't know, I'm sure this is probably some kind of ethical question that people that have in law school that I never went to, but I'm sure it's saying, hey, shutting down the fraud right now or working on for the clients in order to get the money back. Um, this is something that we tackle with, you know, honestly, I usually work for my clients. That's usually my goal. If law enforcement were to come in and ask me, hey, what's your opinion? How would you fight it? I would be more than happy to go ahead and sit down and give my advice or my opinion uh, for what it's worth. Um, you know, but uh, I hope they go ahead and you know, I mean, you know, I can tell you personally that when it came to the binary option law in Israel, I was pretty vocal in a couple of media outlets and saying it shouldn't be watered down and, you know, nobody cared. I mean, I went on TV and said it was a political talking point. It's what it is. That's my opinion. It's, it doesn't do anything. Uh, it's actually makes it harder. It's almost like, um, you know, some of the videos of the spider that about to give birth and smash it and all the spiders run. So now everything became contained. Now it just moves all over the world into jurisdictions that are, you know, much less friendly. And uh, good luck going out and finding someone, you know, in these types of places. So, yeah. In your experience, how much uh, overlap is there, if any, uh, in terms of 
people in technology to these securely criminal brokerages uh, <coughs> and the supposedly regulated primary options companies that may be regulated by gaming regulators in this country or Gibraltar or wherever. Okay, quite a lot. This is definitely a question my attorney warned me of not to go too much into because there's some crazy signing laws in the UK. Um, but there is quite a lot. Um, you know, that I've seen, usually most companies, and not to name names, but they will have, and, and some of the biggest, you know, when it comes to gaming, and, and people that are publicly traded, um, huge Israeli presences, things like this, they have an arm with two people connected where they kind of don't know about it, but they do know about it, uh, where every binary option company that I've seen in Israel will have one regulated brand, and then three unregulated brands, or some combination of this. So, and they'll have different technology for like platform providers, and some of them will be more comfortable taking U.S. Uh, clients, some of them not. Uh, it depends on how, you know, how new they are and what kind of market share they're looking to have. Like right now, Spot will take in a U.S. client. There are, you know, Airsoft is looking, will take, still take U.S. clients on their platform. So, it just depends, but there is always a ton of crossover. Um, every single person I know, I've never met a single company that says, listen, we only do with regulated, and everything's in act in separated accounts, everything is closure 100%. I've never seen it. You mentioned the three brothers who were the uh, behind one of the companies. Right. If I understood you correctly, uh, you know, you have you have many or had many binary option companies, but behind them there were fewer companies. I mean this is the top. Uh, so, presentation. I was just wondering, have you gone after the owners of the company? So, have you uh, <laughs> simply you know, going to them personally, trying to, uh, to uh, get assets from them? Sure. Okay, so with this one in particular, our clients, we actually have reached out to. So, one, we got an active settlement with them, so our clients are trying to get refunded now, so we're getting the assets back, so, you know, thank God we don't have to go that far. But one of these companies is going ahead and filing insolvency. Um, you know, right now in, in Dublin, um, so right now we're trying to fight this again. So this is where some of the challenges where hey, we got to get the best lawyer possible, the best insolvency lawyer in Dublin to go ahead and fight it. Um, it's quite expensive. Now we're talking 200 clients, so we're able to get a global rate. Um, but at the same time, uh, it's difficult to go ahead and to move 200 clients and to explain this uh, to an attorney who doesn't have any experience in this type of product because it's so... Most people that I've noticed, it's easier to explain something that's a little bit over the line than something that's way out there, like their mind doesn't even like, comprehend it for some reason. Um, but we are going ahead and suing these people uh, for getting the money back. Sometimes suing them is not the best way of getting the money back, per se. Sometimes it's applying pressure and exposing the organization, or exposing or putting pressure on the attorney who set up the company. There's a lot of different pressure we're able to apply. Uh, sometimes, like, uh, you know, I remember we sent to Arthur one time, we asked Arthur to go ahead and explain to them the U.S. laws they're violating. And, you know, when you have an ex-U.S. Treasury, you know, IRS special agent go ahead and explain to you what laws you're breaking, sometimes they don't even want to quite more, you know, they just say, okay, you know, like, and then they, you know, they begin to deal. So usually that's the better way to do this because for my opinion, if they're already, if they have nothing to lose, you can't draw blood from a stone. Um, you know, and so I'd rather go ahead and say, listen, hey, I took a hundred million dollars, you have ten million clients, but right? here's your ten million, pay back, don't talk to me for another year. And the next round of clients I have, I can get the money back for those clients as well. Uh, and again, this always comes to this moral or ethical issue. I'm sure that again, I'm sure that someone has addressed it somewhere of what's the, the right thing to do is shutting down a typical of water working for your clients. Um, you know, I, we choose to work for our clients. Uh, I hope that's the right answer in law school. I don't know, um, but um, you know that's what we're trying to do. And so, as long as we're getting money back for our clients, um, that's the only thing which really we are concerned about. But um, it is a small group of people who have benefited from this scam. Very, very small, extremely small. And so, almost think of it like a, a cartel or organized crime because it's in families. And so, you know, certain ones are be at open war with each other, other than work with each other, but there's maybe only a very few groups of people that are working uh, with each other in order to do this. Um, some of them have, have, have some organized crime, you know, um, you know, experience in Israel in the past, and maybe doing uh, gray market money loans or things like this. There's usually some type of element that involved. Um, when you're getting, 
you know, to tell you an attorney that I've worked with in the past, I uh, currently work with, uh, she had a dummy bomb placed under her car, you know, for going after one of these guys, uh, followed around, uh, we've spoken with someone just this week, they were in, um, was it Bulgaria or Romania, I think, uh, so, Bulgaria? Bulgaria. Bulgaria, and uh, she was from the U.S., she wanted to quit, they threw a brick through her window, and they put this sign, you know, under her car, I mean, you know, really scary stuff, so, she's like, I'm not speaking to you until I get touched down in Los Angeles, so, you know, this is, um, you know, this is like the sad reality of this. I mean, that's the, the type of people you're dealing with. Yeah. yeah. So, in your opinion, is Bitcoin a fraud like Jamie Diamond seems to think so? The, you know, I don't, you know, we have this conversation all day in the office, we're getting into arguments about it. Um, the, I, I, I happen to take the side that it is, I don't like to go out and state, but I'm saying there's definitely a fraud in which they're operating with Bitcoin with. Um, it's actually bigger than the big. The Bitcoin in and of itself isn't the question, but because there is such a, um, you know, there's such fervor right now about the Bitcoin um, and the cryptocurrencies, it makes it, you know, much easier for someone to go ahead and commit fraud off of it. Um, if Bitcoin's actually worth nothing in a couple of years, that's irrelevant. But if you're calling somebody and saying, "Hey, listen, I have," and it could be that's their best intention, or someone could actually make a mistake and think this is a great investment vehicle. But when you're calling someone, you're knowing that, hey, I'm taking 10 grand from you, I'm giving you only three back, and this is just my starting offer, and as I built the client for more and more and more, and I know my intention is far, this is where we kind of are, where we're, it's not even like a debate, it's, it's so far over the line, I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's almost comical. Uh, and, you know, and that's the thing where we have people come into the office and I'm saying there's three different uh, cryptocurrency frauds, the ICO, of doing trading with just depositing Bitcoin or going, hey, the, the, the Bitcoin bank scam. Uh, my money seems to be on the Bitcoin bank being the, the, the ultimate scam, and which is going to win out between all three models, uh, which are the cryptocurrency fraud right now, but they're all in their infancy. Probably started six to eight months ago, and these were just really brought on board because of the regulations to binary options. And this is really the birth of this type of fraud. So I have that. I heard Cypher, so you gotta speak up a little bit. Um, I wanted to ask what your view is on Cypher, what the future is for Cypher. If you had an explanation in cases from Cypher. Uh, sure, because of the Cypher is obviously one, the, I think the tax revenue in Cypher is 12.5%, 0% dividend tax. I'm, I'm not an accountant, but this, um, as well as when you get a size set license, uh, it's part of the you know part of the you know the EU. So because they're all binary option companies, the ones that were regulated, they were incorporating in Cyprus, getting a superior bank account, and having a small presence in Cyprus. Uh, to have. Now I think that it's two million euros. olds If you're putting in, you get uh, European citizenship. Uh, they have a lot of different incentives. Um, but now that the you know now that I think this was maybe the trend. Um, maybe the last year or so, but I think that they're actually looking to move the complete operation, you know, to going to be uh, Bulgaria, Romania, Ukraine, very big, the Philippines and Mauritius, rather than moving to Cyprus. Um, and this is just where the advertising is. I think that they will continue to have a small presence, but they won't build massive call centers, um, like they're doing you know, in Israel, where you can walk in and you can see a call center of 50 to 60 people. Um, this will move them to Manila, where you know, they'll have 10 Israeli managers, you can have 500 people working on the floor and you're, you're paying next to nothing for this type of work. I mean, you know, it, let's say, I spoke with someone in Kiev or, you know, so listen, a good salary, someone makes $500 a month, it's amazing, it's a lot of money. You know, $500. I'm going to steal for someone $500 a month, it's crazy. But uh, that's, you know, and they have the nicest offices in the best part of town. And they're running around like they're the Wolf of Wall Street. <laughs> Just to take a calculated guess as to how many syndicates control the binary options trades. I mean, it took it half a dozen, dozen. I would say we're looking at somewhere between 12 and 18 different syndicate groups, and some of them are pretty close. So, hey, listen, you'll maybe go through the ranks of one, and then you'll say, hey, listen, I'll give you a cut, I'll give you a rep share, I can go on my own. Again, there's you know there's a lot of different components. There's the marketing, you know, the, the technology. Uh, usually, it all boils down to the PSP. Because if you can't take credit card payments, you're done. You're done. So they got to get someone who's going to go ahead and be able to process this money. If you're new in the game, no bank, I don't care what letter of opinion you have or how much assets you may have, 
no bank is going to allow you to process binary option um, credit card you know, transactions. The only way to do it is if you have a pre-existing relationship with that bank, um, or you're able to go and have, you know, to run your own aggregator. Um, you get authorization from Visa or MasterCard to run an aggregate account yourself and just controlling who goes in there. I mean, that's kind of the Green Mountain model. Um, and with that model, you're able to just go ahead and to make, just on every transaction, maybe 600, 700 basis points on each transaction. I mean, something really, really massive. So just to follow up with boiler rooms, uh, you know, you get, usually the way it works is one group will steal from the other, they'll go off and they'll take leads, etc. With boiler rooms, historically, with some of the syndicates, they would kill each other. I just was interested in binary options, that happen or not really? Well, thank God, I don't know where anybody's killing each other, but I definitely do about lead stealing. That definitely for sure does happen. Um, and I've actually heard reported conversations or the calls of saying, hey, listen, this, uh, this affiliate is, is going to somebody else, and it's very, very competitive. When people do leave, um, they will go ahead and take a whole database with them. How do I know this? I got people that walk into my office all day and say, I just left the binary option company. I got a whole database with the information of all the client lists. So you're gonna give it to me, you're gonna go to a binary option company. Just make sure they're not divorced and the attorney says they're okay, and we'll take them. Um, but yeah, that's, there's definitely this type of thing. Um, and when it comes to violence, I think that maybe internally there'll be more violence. Uh, me taking the adversarial role, it's mostly been threats or to cars, property. It hasn't gone to that type of level. Um, you know, there was a, a one month to six week point of time we had to have like a Shabbat, like Shin Bet, uh, uh, ex guy, you know, with a with a, with a, with a, with a handgun and it's, it's sign. This guy was protecting some uh, politicians just to go and make sure because there was some threats, you know, that were being made, you know, to people in the office. So when we're getting threats, it must, we must be doing something right. It's a good way to look at it. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Is PayPal part of the economy of the in this sort of fraud, like uh, you know, PayPal in the US was for traffic, and then he was in the hospital when he was traffic, and he was in fraud, and he was in fraud, and people were paying to pay for it. Mm -hmm. You gotta say that again, I'm sorry. I'm, <laughs> I'm having a little trouble. <laughs> is the PayPal, is okay. the PayPal a part of this money or not? Uh, the payments okay. Ah, the PayPal. Ah, most of the payments are not going to come through that way. Um, they're going to have their own aggregator, almost like a PayPal. Like the PayPal is an aggregator, but these are different types of aggregate accounts. These types of aggregate accounts can handle like adult website traffic, uh, gaming traffic. They're able to control different high risk avenues they're able to have. Once by getting the cash amount that they need to go ahead and control this, I mean, this is like a printing press for these guys. Uh, I mean, we're talking so much money. I mean, and we're talking the aggregate loss per client is only two thousand dollars. So this is why it really stays below the radar, and it hasn't been taking, you know, it hasn't been gotten so much attention um, up until very recently.